so my name's Graham Charters. I'm a, an SGSM uh, in IBM, working on uh, in, the, in our app platform area. Um, so that covers uh, our various language uh, capabilities, so Java, Node, Swift, and so on, uh, and also some server-side capabilities, so things like Kachura, which is a Swift-based server, and Open Liberty, which is the, the main thing that I work on. So the, the talk that I've got is, it's a, an introductory talk to cloud native and getting started with cloud native development. So we've just gone from an advanced container talk to an introductory uh, cloud native talk. Uh, I'll start by describing, at least from my perspective, what I think of in terms of cloud native and how we got to cloud native. I'll then move on to uh, looking at some of the characteristics um, to look for from a cloud native environment. And then, to, and then start talking about some of the things you can do to get started. So using generators, for example. Then dig into a little bit in terms of APIs that are useful for doing cloud native applications. And I'll use MicroProfile as a particular example, but the equivalents uh, or similar thing, capabilities exist in the spring world. And then lastly, talk a bit about packaging and containers and so on. Uh, and in there, hopefully time permitting, I'll put in a couple of demos. All right, so background to cloud native. Uh, I'll try and rattle through this quite quickly. I don't want to spend too much time on it. So I'm going to answer, uh, do this in terms of three questions. One is, what is cloud native? But I'll actually use a little bit of history uh, to, to describe how we got to cloud native, at least from my perspective. It might be a bit revisionist or alternative facts, as I believe are now allowed. Uh, and then I'm going to answer probably the most important question, which is, should it be hyphenated? Uh, so let's get on to the, the hyphenated one first. Hands up those who believe it should be hyphenated. Okay, couple. Not hyphenated. Okay, and a few undecided, I think. Um, so I, I Googled this, uh, and, and the first hit I got, it was a bit, bit worrying when it says generally at the start because you want something fairly concrete, but it says hyphenate two or more words when they come before a noun, they modify and act as a single idea. So I'm talking about cloud native Java. To my mind, Java's a noun, and those are a single idea, because it's not cloud Java, and it's not native Java, it's cloud native Java. But anyway, that's just my perspective, and I actually uh, was submitting a and talked to another conference this week with a, with a co-speaker, and I told him about this, and he just came back to me and said, well, I Googled it, and most people don't use the hyphen, so we shouldn't use it. So anyway, just another perspective. Uh, so how did we get to, to cloud native? So back in the early 2000s, um, when waterfall was all the rage, uh, there was a, a, bit of a, a bit of a revolt. So it's quite nice that I'm talking about this in Boston, and I'm a Brit, uh, where we'd been doing waterfall for many years. I was working on, on projects that were doing waterfall deliveries, and there were two main issues with that. One was you could spend years, and we quite literally did, not delivering any, any value to the business. And two, you never knew where you were. Um, so we would we'd do a release, and then we'd say, the next one's going to be a year later. And then we'd get to kind of 11 months in and go, well, actually, it's not. We're going to move it out. So we'd move it out three months, and then three months, and then three months. And then we'd end up shipping it about two years late. So, so Agile said, well, let's break that down into manageable chunks. Let's accept that there are humans involved and design a process that works well for humans. And they came up with. Uh, uh, agile as a process and being able to deliver value on a regular basis, which might be fortnightly, or if you're in the US, it's bi-weekly. Um, and that was great. And so now we could deliver new capabilities on a regular basis, but you then bumped up against the operational side of things, which couldn't get that value into production and therefore, again, deliver that value to the business. And so DevOps uh, came along as this, as this concept of let's do automate everything, do continuous integration, continuous delivery, and now we can deliver that capability into production as soon as it's ready uh, and deliver business, uh, deliver business value. But there was another problem, which was how do we actually, uh, so, sorry, so that, that, uh, that meant that things were ready to go into production, but there was a little bit of the process which was uh, not always a problem, but quite often a problem. If you've got new capabilities going out, uh, is there capacity in your data center to actually uh, actually support that new delivery? Uh, and so this is where cloud comes in, because now you don't have to rely on your data center. You don't have to go and acquire new hardware, get it delivered a few months later, get it provisioned a few months after that, and then eventually you can put the new thing into production. You can now, based on your needs, up and down scale your capabilities by just using cloud capabilities. And so that was the kind of, you got the, uh, now, now a rapid way of going from 
developing some capability to getting in, into production on new infrastructure. But there was still one problem. You hadn't done anything about the architecture of the thing you were delivering. So typically, people were still doing monolithic applications. And there was a need to break that down into manageable chunks. And this is where microservices come in. Uh, and if you're doing microservices as, as described by um, people like Spotify, then you, you also need to do organizational changes and then split your organization up uh, and align those with the capabilities that you're delivering. Uh, and so you end up with squads or teams that uh, own, own the microservices that you want to create. So that's the kind of background to, at least from my perspective, the sorts of things you need to be thinking about in order to do cloud native and be successful with cloud native. You don't have to do all of those, but I think the more of them you do, the more likely you are to be successful. Uh, so let's look, have a look at cloud native environments then and what, uh, what the kind of capabilities are you should be looking for from a cloud native environment. So if you're doing microservices, then you're going to want to have an environment that actually provides microservice capabilities to you. So this is APIs and so on that help you develop, uh, develop and provide microservices, but also consume microservices. You want an environment that's going to start fast and shut down clean. So what we mean here is you're going to be deploying a lot more of, the, uh, a lot more of these things. You want, you want them to be able to start quickly, shut down clean. The, the adage goes, um, treat them like uh, cattle, not pets. You want to be able to shoot them. And if you shoot one of these things, uh, if they get sick, you want to be able to shoot them. Uh, and if you shoot one of these things, you don't want to have stuff lying around that causes you then problems when you start up a new one. Another characteristic you want is, I say proportionately, it's about right, hopefully, small footprint. Um, so you want the things that you are standing up to require just enough disk space, just enough CPU, just enough memory um, to fit the, the things that you're trying to do. So for example, if you've got just a small microservice that's just uh, exposing a REST endpoint and doing some calculation for you, you don't want to have to pay the cost for a full maybe Java e application server in order to deliver that. Because if you're then scaling up and creating tens, hundreds, thousands of instances of those things, each one is going to be a tax. Uh, last, not the last one, uh, next one, facilitate dev prod uh, parity, including through uh, externalized config. Bit of a mouthful, but what we're saying here is if you think about the, what, we, what I said earlier about the uh, DevOps pipeline where you're doing continuous integration, continuous delivery, you want to build the artifact that's going to be uh, put into production as soon as possible and not change that uh, as you go through the pipeline. Because if you're rebuilding that in the last stage and then putting it into production, you're effectively invalidating the testing that's gone before. And one of the mechanisms to do that is by externalizing configuration, for example. So things that are going to vary as you go through your pipeline, if you put those into external configuration that can, that can then be injected into the artifact that you're going to put in production, um, then that means that you don't have to rebuild that artifact. So if you want to change the port, for example, you just provide that as external configuration or change security configuration and location of services and so on. Uh, you externalize all those capabilities. And lastly, uh, can be easily containerized. So uh, you may be using Cloud Foundry. You may be using other cloud environments. You don't want the choice of, uh, em of environment that you're using to, to develop your microservice or your cloud native application to limit uh, where you can deploy to. Uh, so you want to make sure it can be containerized. All right, so that's kind of background to environments uh, and, and characteristics of environments you should be looking for. Uh, generators are actually a popular way to get started. So you, you decided you're going to do a cloud native application. I want to start writing something. Uh, and a lot of people use generators. Um, there are a number of generator options, and I'll go through a few of those now. Uh, so if you're wanting to do a Spring Boot application, then you can start off with uh, jhipster. So the jhipster supports a couple of uh, application types. You can do web applications. They refer to them as monolithic applications. And you can do microservices. And what jhipster does is it uses, uh, it uses different generators to produce essentially a full application using Spring Boot, Angular, and Bootstrap. Another option is one that's provided uh, by the company I work for, IBM, um, which is a CLI command line interface uh, called BXDev. Uh, 
This one will generate uh, for many different languages. So it will generate Swift, Node, Java, Groovy, I think it does as well. And it'll do different application types, so web applications, uh, microservices, which can be using MicroProfile or Spring, uh, and BFF, which is backend for front-end applications. So this is a, a, an application pattern or a pattern for developing mobile applications, for example, where you uh, end, uh, where it generates a backend service in support of the front end and you use the same implementation technologies or the same language technologies to implement both of those pieces. Next up, Spring Initializer. Uh, so this is a very popular way to get started with Spring, app Spring applications. If you go to start.spring.io, uh, you can go and choose the technologies you want to use, choose the version of Spring Boot and so on, choose whether you want a Maven build or a Graven bu uh, Gradle build, and then it will do a generation of a, uh, a starter project, and you can download, download the, a zip file of the project, unzip it, and then, uh, and then build it. Uh, it primarily gives you a kind of skeleton Spring Boot app and, and uh, a Maven build, which will then pull down the dependencies. Next one, Maven Archetypes. So Maven Archetypes are a kind of generic uh, generation capability. Uh, so, but, but there are also a number of Maven archetypes that have been written to generate different project types. Uh, so, for example, web applications or microservices and so on. Uh, if you want to write your own generators, then you can also use Maven, uh, Maven archetypes to do that. So you just pick one that's out in open source and modify it to, to generate whatever you'd like. And then lastly, Yeoman. Uh, so Yeoman, again, similar to Maven archetypes, is a, a generic uh, generator capability. But there are also a suite of many, many generators provided, uh, provided by Yeoman. Yeoman's actually used under the covers by um, Jay Hipster, and it's also used by BXDev. The advantage, I think, of using things like BXDev or um, Spring Initializer is they do their generation in the cloud, so you don't have to go and install Yeoman locally. OK. so. You, you, you've got started, you're generating, uh, generating a project. Let's have a look at some of the, um, uh, what it means to provide mic microservice technology. So I said earlier on about um, some of the, the things to look for. You want, you, you want to have good microservice capabilities. Um, so I'm going to use MicroProfile as an example, but as I said, um, Spring Boot provides similar capabilities through things like Hystrix and so on. Um, and I'm going to describe it in kind of three, three classes of capabilities. So the starting point is you're probably want to go, going to want to write um, some kind of REST APIs, exposing REST APIs or consuming REST APIs. Um, so Eclipse MicroProfile, what, what MicroProfile did is it said, to do cloud native applications, you don't want all these Java E technologies, all these Java E, uh, Java e capabilities. We'll just cherry pick a few capabilities, similar to how Springs, uh, Spring has done things, and pick the ones that are going to be best for doing cloud native microservices. Um, so it picked CDI as a component model, JSONP for doing processing of JSON payloads, uh, JAXRS2 for doing uh, writing REST services, but also for calling REST services. But the JAXRS2 client uh, isn't particularly nice, so the, the collaboration, the Eclipse MicroProfile collaboration also defined uh, REST client, which is a type safe client for, uh, quite a nice, neat type safe client for calling microservices. All right, so you're now you're able to um, uh, write microservices, REST services, and consume REST services. Uh, but if you're putting these into production, you're, you're going to have hundreds of these things collaborating, maybe thousands, and they're going to be frequently evolving if you're doing your agile delivery of these things. And that introduces requirements for new APIs. So, for example, you probably, you've, if you've organized your teams around these microservices, you want to be able to define APIs, um, API boundaries between those microservices. Open API is a, is anybody here familiar with Open API? Got one. Anyone, fil <laughs> two. Anyone familiar with Swagger? Oh, a little bit more, right. Okay, so Open API is just an evolution of Swagger. Um, it's a standardization of the Swagger cap capabilities. So we're up to Open API v3, um, which describes some more capabilities for how to describe, uh, describe APIs. So what this does is it lets you, uh, there's default generation for the, for the definition of the API, and you get the API definition in YAML. I think you can also get it in JSON format. 
And you can, if you want to have a more advanced description or more advanced definition of the API, then you can use annotations to, to augment the, the generation capabilities. Uh, fault tolerance, what fault tolerance does is it allows you to, if you're familiar with things like Hystrix and so on, it, it gives you the capabilities to do things like timeouts, retries, fallback, um, bulkhead patterns, um, circuit breaker and so on. JWT, uh, so what JW, uh, so, so fault tolerance is important if you've got lots of microservices that are collaborating and maybe one of them goes down briefly or is, becomes unreliable for a period of time, then you want to be able to handle those failures gracefully. So you need some kind of fault tolerance capabilities. J, JWT gives you uh, a security capability so you can flow JSON web tokens between microservices and then uh, extract role uh, or group information and user information out of those and then use that to, to decide whether you're going to allow that person or that, uh, if that person's in a particular group to actually um, call some of the operations within your microservice. So it's a way of securing your microservices. And then lastly, in this layer, config. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, externalizing your configura uh, configuration is important as you push things through the pipeline. And what config 1.2 does, or what config does, microprofile config does, is it lets you have static config or dynamic config. Static config's read on startup. Dynamic uh, is read each time you access it. Uh, static's probably uh, good enough for most use cases in microservices. And it also lets you define different config providers and extend those config providers and have a layering of those configs so you can have overrides and so on. So lastly, um, if you've got tens, hundreds of thousands, or whatever large number of, of collaborating services, you need a strong operations focus. And so the last layer, if you like, is there are three specifications and implementations in Eclipse MicroProfile. One is open tracing, which lets you trace requests as they go through, uh, uh, as they go through your microservices, so you can understand the flow of the request. There's health check, which lets you um, define what, what it means for your microservice to be healthy. Um, so that might include, can I connect to a database that I'm using, or can I connect and call a service that I depend on, and so on. So you can do quite fine-grained tests in there and then report health back. The health, if it fails, if it says that it's unhealthy, it, re it returns a 503, so you can then point, for example, your um, Kubernetes probes, liveness or readiness probes um, at the endpoint and use that to define, uh, to determine whether your container is healthy. And then lastly, metrics. Metrics lets you get hold of and understand inside the runtime what's my JVM looking like, what's my heap, um, garbage collector, and so on, so you can get metrics information out. You can also use metrics to define application metrics, which will then be, uh, then be returned as well. Um, that by default, they come out in Prometheus format, but you can also get a JSON format. All right, so I'll do a quick, uh, hopefully a quick demo of some of those capabilities. Actually, I didn't need to close that. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start two services up. So that's the first one. And don't ask why there's no service B. I think it's historical reasons. <laughs> And that's the second one. So basically, I've got two services, A and C. Um, C a, a is called by C. C will return the system properties or a system property that you request um, for, the, for the, the runtime it's running in. Uh, and A has some fault tolerance capabilities. So let's have a look. Uh, did I? Yeah, I did start that one up. So just a quick look at service C. Um, so what service D C does is it's going to return a, a response with the system property in that you've requested. It also has this mode. So what we've done is in this service, we've coded some, uh, some behaviors um, to exhibit things like um, slow responses or failure responses and so on. And so service A can actually request what type of behavior you want, it, it wants from it just to, to help with demo purposes. And so we'll also have a look at service, what I've done on service A side. Uh, 
All right, so service A, here's the service that's actually going to call this helper class. And inside this helper class, we've um, got methods that are going to exhibit various different types of fault tolerance capabilities. Um, so for example, uh, timeout capabilities, retry capabilities, and so on. So first thing I'll do is I'll just, on service A, That's big enough. Can you see that? Nope. Make it a little bit bigger. OK. So that's re um, requesting the WLP installed, which is, is a system property that WebSphere, or sorry, uh, that Liberty, or Open Liberty in this case, puts in uh, into the system properties. So that's the location that the, the installation is running out of. And you can see it's service C. So service A has managed to call service C, and it's returned, returned the appropriate value. So so that was calling the method that just make, uh, we know works. So now I'll call a different one, which is going to try, uh, which is essentially, I'm going to do no retry. But I'm also going to, what no retry does is actually tell the target service to fail every other request. So you can see now that every other request is failing. So now, uh, and you can see in the helper how no retry is done. Um, so it's just a standard method, but it's, it's passing in a thing that tells it to fail. So I now, with this retry annotation, uh, I'll call the, the with retry. And we'll see it. It succeeds every time. So internally, what happens? It makes the request, it fails, and then it retries it. And on the second request each time, uh, it's succeeding. So everything's working fine. So now we'll try one other scenario. So we'll do uh, with timeout. And what this is going to do is it's going to tell it to, tell it to um, delay the response. And actually, initially, it's going to time out. So there's a bit, bit, bit of a brief pause, and then we get a timeout. So it, it's failing every time now after this brief pause. And what we're going to do is with timeout and fallback, and we're going to add in a fallback now. So it's going to t um, call the target service uh, and fail because of the timeout. And then it's going to call the local service to get the fallback. And we know it's called the local service because we can see now that the, the installation directory is actually the installation for service A. Um, so that's just showing simply how you can, let me just show you the code for that one. So we can code a timeout. We say after 500 milliseconds, I want to time out the request. And if I time out the request, then I want to call this fallback method. And as I said, this fallback method just returns the system property that we were requesting, but for the local service. OK. Uh, the other thing I was going to show you was health. So I'm going to go to the health endpoint for service A. And you can see it, everything's happy. Uh, it's, it's doing a test on service C, because in order for service A to be considered healthy, um, it, needs, it needs to be able to use service C. And what I can do now is just take service C down. And when we do the request, we'll see it says it's done a test against service C, seen that service C is down, uh, and therefore the outcome, the total outcome over all the tests is that this service is actually down. Uh, and that can report, be reported back on probes, as I mentioned, for Kubernetes, for example. OK, how are we doing for time? OK, so last, last uh, topic I want to cover is packaging for deployment. So one of the things you need to consider when you, you know, you're choosing what you're going to build and, and create is what your target environment is and what kind of art artifact you want to create. And it's quite common nowadays. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of artifact types to create runnable jars. And, and as I mentioned, you want those things to be 
um, appropriately sized um, for what you're trying to do, um, so, or right-sized, as I'm talking about here. And I'll just talk about a few examples of how to get right-sized runnable jars. Um, so I mentioned Spring Initializer earlier on. So if you use Spring Initializer, and in, here in this case, I've selected Jersey for Jack's RS, and I've, let, I've selected Pivotal Cloud Foundry Circuit Breaker capabilities. What that does is it generates a, a project with a POM file, because I've chosen Maven, yep. Uh, and that POM file has dependencies on the things that you've said you need. So when you do that build, it pulls down those dependencies, and then the runnable jar you get only, only includes the capabilities that you said you've required in the build. There are other, other environments that do, the same, uh, do similar capabilities. So in this particular example, this is the Liberty server. You can specify what features you want to use or what capabilities you want to use. So in this case, I'm, I'm saying I want to use MicroProfile 1.3, which is the set of capabilities I described earlier. In the build, you can say I want it to be minimal or minify it, so only include those capabilities, and I want it to be runnable, um, so I'll get a, a runnable jar out of it as a result. Um, in this particular example, you end up with a runtime that's about 45 megs. And then last one, just to include uh, another one, uh, Wildfly Swarm Fractions. So if you use, uh, use JBoss Technologies, Wildfly, uh, the Wildfly server, you can, in your POM dependencies, define dependencies on uh, what they call fractions, uh, swarm fractions, and then it will build a runnable jar just including those capabilities. Um, so as I mentioned, um, containerization or Docker, a lot of cloud environment, well, you'd be hard pushed to find a cloud environment that doesn't support Docker. Uh, so you want to also consider what you might want to do for Docker. Um, it's quite interesting when you get to looking at Docker, there's a bit of a, a kind of contention between building runnable jars and doing Docker containers. Uh, and so what I mean is that uh, when, if you build a runnable jar, your jar file essentially contains runtime capabilities. It contains, uh, it might contain your uh, servlet container, it might contain the JAXRS implementation, Jersey in the example I show, showed earlier for Spring Initializer. And to get good performance out of Docker, you want, your, you want to define your layers, your Docker image layers, um, in such a way that your last layer only contains the things that are gonna change most frequently, which is your application code. But if in your, your layers you're actually building in the entire runnable jar, then that, that last layer is gonna contain a lot of uh, essentially middleware or, or libraries and things which don't change frequently, but they are going to essentially be changed all the time each time you do a rebuild. And that, that means that you're not taking uh, good advantage of all the, the capabilities that Docker has around caching of images. And so uh, going for maybe a thin war approach or um, you'll see there's talk about in places about what they call hollow jars. Um, I'm not convin convinced that hollow jar is uh, necessarily a good way to go. Um, but it's, it's, something worth, it's something worth considering. Okay, so last demo. I've got one and a half minutes, I think. Actually, let's go to, I need to kill that off. So I talked a little bit about um, dev prod parity and, and you wanting your, um, essentially to be able to build something uh, as soon as possible in the pipeline that is eventually the artifact you put into production. Um, but that, what you can also do, um, and I'll give a quick demo of this, is you can actually do your development using Docker containers. So you can, for example, um, have a Docker container that's built on, uh, that depends on the image that your production container is going to use. And then in this particular example, so if I just show you what I'm doing here. In this, so I'm gonna run a Docker container that I've, that I've pre-built that depends on the server environment that I'm gonna use in production. So it's using the same image uh, for the server environment I'm using in production. But then I'm gonna map in all the things that um, my runtime is gonna look for um, that correspond to my application capabilities. Those, so those are coming in t into the Docker container um, through volumes. So if I just run that, 
So I've done a, a build of a project, uh, and I built my, my Docker image. And then, so I have an application. Oops, yeah, I need the code. So I have a simple uh, greeting application. And because of the way the, um, the server will pick up, and pick up the artifacts uh, and run those as part of the application, and because the Java language server in VS Code, uh, Eclipse, and IntelliJ do similar things, because the language server will, change, uh, will um, compile things when I change the files, what I can do is Although it's running in a container, I can, so I'll show you the application. So it's just returning a greeting based on a name passed in. I can actually make changes to the code and have those picked up. So the, essentially the, The container isn't isn't inhibited. The use of the container isn't inhibiting me, uh, and it's giving me an environment, a development environment that's going to be very close to what I'm doing in production. So there, I've just made a code change, uh, and it, the language server's compiled it, put the class file in the right location, and the server's picked that up, uh, just shown the change. So that's a, a way of of kind of getting better dev prod parity um, as you're doing your development. Okay. So slightly over, I'll just finish on the last slide. Okay, so in summary, um, if you're gonna go down a cloud native route, it's best to consider both the organizational and technological changes you need to make um, to increase your likelihood of success. So I talked about um, agile, DevOps, cloud, and uh, microservices, and alignment of your teams, and so on. Um, you can get a head start by using generators. It's a nice way to get starter projects, um, get going, uh, and choosing. You need to choose a generator that's appropriate for the technologies you're going to use. You want to leverage microservice technologies, as, as we saw with the microprofile examples, um, for doing development of your microservices, but also more of the management side of your microservices. Choose an appropriate packaging for your cloud, which might be a runnable jar, might be containers. Uh, you want to maximize consistency through your delivery pipeline, um, so you're not invalidating the testing that goes on uh, earlier on in the pipeline. Uh, if you're deploying into Docker, you want to strive for thin application layers to make, uh, take advantage of the, the Docker caching capabilities. And lastly, don't forget the hyphen. So, any questions? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>